in order for Antichrist to come into power, his kingdom needs to be ready. He only has seven years at the most, so he's not going to waste any time building the infrastructure. Hence, the technology, the monetary system, the necessary wars and fear to get people to want to receive the mark of the beast are all being used right now in order to soften up people's hearts to receive the world's new leader, Satan's man, Antichrist. But before we go there, I want to remind you of this Bible passage because we need to hear it and we need to be encouraged, but it also helps us to understand the dynamics of the world we live in and what is coming. In Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 10, the apostle John wrote, he said, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. In other words, the devil, the one who accuses us day and night, he's been cast out of heaven. Then verse 11 goes on to say, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. Listen, that verse, verse 12, or verse 11 of Revelation chapter 12, it's talking about the people who, who come to faith in Christ after the rapture, during the tribulation period, and how they overcome the devil, how they overcome Antichrist, is by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and not loving their life unto death. In other words, it's really a reminder for us also, for those living at that time, they're really going to be faced with trial and persecution. But for us right now, when we see things closing in, what do we do? Uh, That's the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. God has saved us, and we don't love our lives unto death. We recognize this world is not our home. No matter what happens to us here, we are going home to heaven. But then the very next verse, Revelation chapter 12, verse 12 says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in the heavens. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. That is speaking of the time at the midpoint of the tribulation period, and God is warning what is coming to the planet is going to be absolutely devastating for all those who don't know Christ. For us now, we're going to be raptured first. And then for those who come to know Christ during the tribulation period, what do we know? They're going to be strengthened by the blood of the Lamb, the reminder that Christ has saved them, the word of their testimony, and recognizing this world is not my home. I'm going to heaven. But the devil's going to come down with great wrath, says here, because he knows he has a very short time time but why does it say the heavens are rejoicing because it's the reality that there is joy knowing that jesus is coming again and he is going to establish his kingdom here on earth so we put all of this together but we recognize the kingdom of antichrist is coming we're watching the building of the infrastructure right now that's what's taking place the infrastructure of the beast system. So with uh, all the preparation that we are seeing taking place right now, it is the building of the infrastructure for the coming beast system. And in that, one area is often overlooked, almost completely overlooked, but it is absolutely necessary because without conquering this one area, the Antichrist will never come to power. It is the area of the human mind. All right, but how is this being done? Well, don't miss this because it is awful yet amazing to see how this is happening right now. In the last episode, we talked about the great light of Jesus and how this world is taking the shape of what the Bible says it will look like in the last days. In that episode, we also looked at George Orwell's work, 1984. And as I mentioned, in the novel, Big Brother's government includes a division known as Thought Police. So you might wonder how a government, I said, could ever police thought. Orwell's solution was ingenious. 
Big Brother created something called Newspeak. The repressive government changed the meanings of words, creating a new dictionary. And with it, the fictional totalitarian government rewired the minds of its citizens. Can it really work that way, I asked? Language deeply influences thought. We think in concepts, but we also think with words. One of the best ways to change patterns of thought is to change patterns of language. So I said all of that in the episode last week, and it's going to lead us up to where we are going right now because, folks, the minds of the masses are being changed. And in a 1946 essay, Orwell wrote, if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. I'm going to show you exactly how that works. It's happening at an alarming rate. In fact, many, even in the church, are already seemingly completely deceived by it. So let's work through this. On Wednesday, June 26th, Jenna Longoria, Jenna's 16-month-old son, and her mother were attempting to fly on a United Airlines flight from San Francisco to Austin, Texas. But they were not allowed to board the plane. Jenna immediately went to social media to tell her side of what happened. She said, the flight attendant has denied access to us because he said that I made a derogatory comment about one of the flight attendants because I didn't use their right pronoun. Now they are forbidding us to get on the plane because she misgendered them. United Airlines tells another side. They claim that it was not the case and it had to do with luggage. Which side is telling the truth? We may never know, but this entire story is indicative of the strange world that we live in. But there is more. Again, thinking on Orwell's novel 1984 and Newspeak and Thought Police. We're seeing it work out in real time. So let's continue. The Miss Universe pageant and its subsidiary pageants use the slogan, Run by Women for Women. But it's a lie. It's really owned and operated by a biological male who claims to have been born into the wrong body. According to news reports, this person is a terror to work with. In May of this year, in an unprecedented action, both Miss USA and Miss Teen USA resigned before finishing their terms. Non-disclosure agreements keep them from saying much, but it's easy to read between the lines of what they did say. Miss Teen USA said that her personal values no longer fully align with the direction of the organization. Miss USA says she resigned in order to protect her mental health. And speaking of reading between the lines, internet sleuths noticed something odd in Miss USA's resignation statement. Listen to this. The first letter in each sentence that she wrote If put together, spell out, I am silenced. The Miss USA organization's social media director also resigned her post at around the same time. Other subsidiaries of the Miss Universe and Miss USA pageants include state pageants such as Miss Maryland USA. And on June 1st, they held the Maryland pageant and selected or at least announced a winner. Later that month, The Daily Signal ran a story headlined, Miss Maryland contestants push back after male winner steals their crown. Most contestants didn't know that they had been competing against a man until after the pageant. Many later worried that the fix was in. One contestant said, what are the odds that a trans-identifying individual wins Miss Maryland USA title on the first day of Pride Month? Yeah, no kidding. Another said, it did not seem like a coincidence, especially when the owner of the pageant is a transgender woman herself. And upon winning the contest, Kennedy went out to march in Washington, D.C.'s Capital Pride 
parade. Wow. Rules for the Miss Universe family of pageants now allow male contestants. They dress in the same dressing rooms and share hotel rooms with the females. That presumably applies to Miss Teen USA, where the contestants can be as young as 14. And then there's more. Miss Marilyn contestant Elizabeth McCarthy said, I was disgusted and disappointed that the pageant coordinators allowed women to undress in front of a man without any disclosure. And then she added, I just don't understand what happened to embracing your true self, the self that God made perfectly in his image. And then she continued and said, I feel that men are taking over everything that women worked so hard for. I look at this and say, where are the women's rights groups in all of this? But all of this, as we're watching, it's a plan. It's a master plan of deception. And I'm telling you, it is Orwell's Newspeak from 1984, where right is wrong and wrong is right. But some of you are old enough to remember the movie Tootsie from 1982. And in it, Dustin Hoffman was a man playing the part of a woman. It was comedy. And the idea that it takes a man to be a really great woman seemed absurd in 1982. That was part of the humor. But today, that idea is being played out on sports fields, talk shows, and even during story time at the library. Men are the best. They even make better women than women. It's a sick idea but it is fast permeating the world, especially the Western world. We'll come back to that as we get to the end and why I believe it's happening right here. In society today, calling men men and women women are considered fighting words. Some will say that I just misgendered the flight attendant because I said the truth about his or her sex. This is Orwell's Newspeak. The repressive government is changing the meanings of words, creating a new dictionary. And with it, the rising totalitarian government is in the process of rewiring the minds of its citizens. And they know uh, they don't need the older generation. It will be impossible to change the majority of their minds. People that have been around for decades have a moral compass to navigate from. And they can smell a rat. And they know how bad this is. But this is why we see the government pressing so hard to get the minds of children. And it is working with devastating effects. At Hope For Our Times, our mission is to spread the hope of Jesus Christ through the Word of God. Your generous contributions empower us to create impactful videos and resources that offer hope during uncertain times. We invite you to partner with us in our mission. If you feel called to support us, please visit our website at hopeforourtimes.com where you'll find various ways to contribute financially. Additionally, donations can be sent by mail to Hope For Our Times, 1281 North State Street, Suite A311, San Jacinto, California, 92583. Your partnership directly fuels our efforts to develop new resources and connect with a wider audience. By partnering with us, you become an integral part of our mission to share the hope of Jesus Christ with a world in need. And now let's return to the Tom Hughes Report. Well, let's continue. Last year, The Hill ran an opinion piece on guidelines then proposed by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC. It began and said, a federal government obsessed with gender ideology has decided that misgendering is now a thought crime. I'm not kidding you. This really does say this. And it is dead set on muzzling religious objectors. Misgendering is one of the new mortal sins of the secular catechism, and there's no recourse in the EEOC's new enforcement guidance for those with sincerely held religious beliefs 
that it is wrong to deny the actual biological sex that God has assigned to each human being. A modified version of the guidelines became official in May of this year. In the draft of its guidance, the EEOC said employers do not and cannot provide Title VII religious accommodations for behavior that is considered harassment. The only thing clear is that they call it harassment to truthfully refer to a man as a man if he says that he is a woman. Uh, they also say it's harassment if he is not allowed to use the women's restroom. Calling this guidance would be funny if it weren't so Orwellian. Guidance from the federal government sounds benign and caring, but it can get you fired, it can get you fined, sued, or put out of business. It isn't really law, but until it is rescinded by another administration, ruled unconstitutional by the courts, or overridden by an actual law passed by the actual Congress, as opposed to something made up by the deep state, it carries the same weight as law. But in the U.S. federal government's version of Newspeak, it is merely guidance. You can't make these things up. However, this is happening right now in the world that we live in. So I look back and think of Orwell's Newspeak, and I think we're living it, we are experiencing it, and especially younger people. It's like the entire younger generations are being swept up by this madness. Merriam-Webster.com defines misgender as to identify the gender of a person incorrectly, such as by using an incorrect label or pronoun. Well, what on earth does that mean? If a person says they are another gender, then you need to accept it and deal with it. That's what it's saying. It's your problem. Well, here's a fact. Real misgendering is telling a little boy that he might be a girl or a little girl that she might be a boy. That is sexual abuse on a level never seen before, but welcome to 1984 and 2024. In all of this, keep in mind that God is not the author of confusion, but Satan is. He's a murderer from the beginning, and he's the father of lies. Listen, that explains a lot. Uh, here, think on this. Uh, the C.S. Lewis book, Mere Christianity presents a powerful argument against people who say Jesus was a good moral teacher, but he was not God. Uh, Lewis wrote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the real foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. I'm not giving you the whole quote because as compelling as his argument is, that's not my point Jesus claimed to be God the Son, and he backed up that claim in countless ways. But if you met someone on the street who made the same claim, you would think that that person suffered from a mental disorder. It, it would be a matter of mental health, not a reason for anger or disdain. And if he thought, as Lewis said, something like that, he'd be the equivalent of a poached egg. In God's eyes, that man would be no less important than other men. But he wouldn't really be a poached egg. A person who claims to be a man and also claims to be pregnant likewise has at best a major mental health issue, uh, but instead of seeing it as a matter of mental health or even demon possession, society began to tell us a few years ago, play along, pretend it's true. And now, in 2024, we are even being told to deal with it and accept it as true. As we are being more and more indoctrinated in the ways of Orwell's warnings of Newspeak and the totalitarian rulers of his 1984 novel, 
Kids are not allowed to pretend they are cowboys or Indians anymore because that's evil, that's racist. A football team named the Redskins is racist, so the name must be changed because somebody somewhere might have been offended. But a little boy is told to pretend he's a girl. And then he's told that since he pretended to be a girl, therefore he must really be a girl. And we have complicit teachers and school boards that find a doctor to cut off his private parts. Folks, this is sick. It is of the devil who is a liar and a murderer. But our Western culture insists that it is immoral and you are evil if you don't support this. In other words, it is evil to tell the truth. And think of this. Why is this not happening in places like Russia or China or Islamic countries? They would never do this sort of thing. They wouldn't even allow it. I think it's interesting that this type of thought, uh, the whole newspeak thing, is only happening in the West, the Western world where Antichrist rises up from. This is probably why uh, there's so much deception and mass confusion and lies in the schoolrooms, in the courtrooms, in the media, in the halls of government, in the White House. This world is being prepared for the rise of Antichrist, the coming leader of the revived Roman Empire. When it comes to children, listen, think of the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, where Jesus said, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. I think of those words of Jesus and what is happening right now at the hands of parents who are complicit, teachers that are complicit, school boards, the government, right here in the United States of America. And you see how people, and especially children, are being targeted and being manipulated, and their minds are being changed. Uh, they're told such things that what God says is good is really bad, and what the world and the devil say is good it really is good. Listen, these are the words of Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 20, where Isaiah warned, Woe unto them that call evil good and, ge and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Wow, folks, we live in this day. And again, I think of the offense Jesus warns of those who have done this sort of thing to children. It would be better for them if a millstone were tied around their neck and they were thrown into the sea, then offend one of God's little ones. The Bible also tells us that his angels watch over the little children. You look, think, wow, what is set for those who are doing such things is judgment in what the Bible describes as hell forever. And by the way, I look at this, and Jesus even warned in Matthew chapter 24 in the Olivet Discourse, he said, Listen, one of the signs of his second coming, he said, many will be offended because of me. In other words, you tell people the truth, oh, they're going to be offended. You tell them about Jesus, oh, they're going to be offended. It seems you can't not offend anyone anymore, especially if you tell them the truth. And as we live in this world where newspeak is being worked out, where right is wrong and wrong is right, but this world is being prepared with all of the deception and all of the confusion. It's the one area that most people overlook. We look at technology. We look at uh, science. We look at the geopolitical situation. We look at Israel and we can tell that all of the infrastructure is going into place to prepare the way for Antichrist, including a coming temple in Jerusalem so Antichrist can sit in it. But what we often forget is the mind and the hearts of the people have to be prepared to actually think that Antichrist is the Messiah. And folks, what we are witnessing right now is the preparation of the mind and the heart. But be encouraged, because as we look at all of these things that are coming together, we could list sign after sign after sign. 
There's over a hundred signs of the first coming of Christ in the Bible. And all of those signs were fulfilled when Jesus came the first time. That we would be forgiven of our sins. But did you know there are hundreds of signs of the second coming of Christ in the Bible? It was Tim LaHaye who said years ago there's five times as many signs of the second coming of Christ as of his first. And I think it was Joel Rosenberg who said there were eight times as many signs in the Bible as there, uh, Jesus' second coming than there were of his first. And we are watching all of the signs, including what we talked about today, the confusion, the lies, the deception, coming together all at the same time. And this is a reminder that we would be encouraged because Jesus warned us, this is what the world is going to look like before we are called home. And he told his disciples in Matthew chapter 24, he said, see, I have told you these things beforehand. And also in Isaiah chapter 46, the Bible says, God tells us the end from the beginning. Why? So that we would know. So when we see all of these things happening, we would do the opposite. Instead of being discouraged, we would be encouraged. And what would we do? In the words of Jesus himself, he said, this is what we ought to do when we see all of these things begin to take place. The perilous times, uh, the leaders of the nations being perplexed, all of the different things. When we see all these things beginning to take place, Jesus said, what are we to do? Look up and lift up our head because our redemption draws near. Listen, lift up your head. Jesus has won the victory. He is coming again. He's calling us home. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to The Tom Hughes Report. We pray today's program was a blessing to you. The purpose of The Tom Hughes Report is to guide individuals toward the hope that can only be found in a personal relationship with Jesus. We encourage you to explore our website at thetomhughesreport.com and reach out to us through the contact page. We value your feedback and would love to hear from you. A special thank you to his channel for graciously allowing us to utilize their wonderful studios for recording The Tom Hughes Report. Don't forget to explore their website at hischannel.com for an array of Christ-centered programs. Make sure to join us again next week for another insightful episode of The Tom Hughes Report. And always remember to look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. Hey everyone, check this out. I want to invite you to Southern California in November. Uh, right now, I'm obviously not there. I'm in Colorado at the Garden of the Gods. In fact, we've been all over the world, but uh, coming in November, November 8, 9, and 10, uh, we're gonna have a conference there. It's called the End of the World Conference, and it's following the election, so who knows what's gonna happen between now and then, especially after the election. And uh, it doesn't matter who wins, doesn't matter which way this go, we are going to be getting together, and uh, it's gonna be an incredible time. We have a huge list of speakers, some of the best and most that I've ever been able to put together. And I want to encourage you, check it out. Uh, go to the events page at hopeforourtimes.com. It'll give you all of the information there. It'll list all of the speakers. It'll let you know what's going on. And it also gives you an opportunity to register. But I really can't wait to meet you again to Southern California coming up November 8, 9, and 10. Can't wait to see you.